Yes, oh. yes, yes, we're live. Okay, well, welcome everybody who's online as well and in the room. Thank you for coming. So it's um, a real pleasure introducing our speaker for today, Vanessa Seifert, whom uh, a lot of the people online for sure will know, and, and maybe some of you here as well. She uh, is a philosopher of chemistry who did her PhD with James Lehman, then um, was part of the, the big meta science project yes. uh, with Thomas Stacco and Francesca Benazzi mm -hmm. and, and many others, and did some amazing things there. And is now a Marika Iskodowska Fellow at the University of Greece, yes. where she embarked on uh, a pretty important project because it is um, maybe one of the most central. Um, things in chemistry, namely chemical reactions, and yet this is somehow completely underexplored mm -hmm. in philosophy of chemistry. So uh, I'm extremely anxious to hear what you have to tell us about the nature of chemical reactions. So the floor is yours. You have a one hour more or less for your talk. We'll have a very short five minute break, and then we'll come back and we'll have another hour for the q &A. Okay, perfect. You Thank you very much, Peter, for uh, inviting me and giving me the chance to um, talk about the, this project. Um, I should warn from the beginning, this is a working project, a working progress, sorry. Um, so there's still things that um, I haven't decided on, I haven't yet understood fully, um, uh, but you know, hopefully it will help me um, progress and uh, get closer to what I want to say at the end of this project. Uh, given that I have a lot of time, let me tell you a little bit about this. The project is called uh, CREACO, or CRECO. I don't know how I should pronounce it. It's a shorthand for chemical reactions as causes and laws. Uh, essentially, what I want, uh, what I'm trying to uh, do is explore the nature of chemical reactions from a chemical perspective, from a metaphysical perspective, see whether they correspond to causes, to causal relations, and consequently to laws of nature. Uh, so, and this is also what I'm going to show today. Uh, a short definition first, chemical reactions, a process by which one or more chemical substances or entities, I, I, I put it more loosely, transform into other uh, chemical entities. Chemical reactions involve a recombination of the atoms uh, and possibly the destruction and formation of new chemical bonds. They do not involve changes of the atomic number of the elements. Okay, so it's a very specific kind of transformation found in nature. Now, why be interested as philosophers, or from a philosophical perspective, uh, in chemical reactions? Uh, there are plenty of reasons for that. First, they are everywhere. Uh, combustion, uh, rust, photosynthesis, how batteries work, um, what we eat, the, the products we use to clean, uh, the beer and wine that we drink, everything is a product of chemical transformation. In fact, I would go so far as to say, I don't think it's very controversial, that there wouldn't be any life uh, were it not for chemical transformations uh, on Earth. So they are very important um, and they are ubiquitous. Uh, the second reason why we should be interested in them because they play a historic role in the ident identification of chemical elements. Uh, it was based on the notion of chemical transformation and on the inability to further transform chemically a substance that Boyle and Lavoisier defined what chemical elements are. To, are, to remind, for example, Lavoisier says that a chemical element is a substance that cannot be decomposed using current analytical methods. And Boyle made it even more explicit that what he meant is that they cannot be further decomposed uh, via chemical reactions, right? So it is um, a defining part of what it is to be a chemical element. Now, more generally, it's a defining feature of chemistry as a field as well. Cambridge Dictionary, just uh, to offer an example, says that, the that chemistry is a scientific study of the basic characteristic of substances and the ways in which they react or combine. The majority of what we do, of what people do rather in chemistry, has to do with understanding chemical transformations. Right? So it's a very, very important part of chemical knowledge. Now, this uh, comes in, in contrast with what happens in philosophy of chemistry, where if you look at the literature, uh, most analysis, especially metaphysical analysis, 
uh, focuses on uh, chemical entities, on the nature of atoms, molecules, chemical substances, compounds, and so forth. And not so much on how they transform. To put it in a different way, there seems to be an implicit reductionist view, not in the classical philosophical sense, that if we are to understand the nature of chemical stuff, we are to understand also how they relate chemically and transform, which is not, in my view, quite evident. I think there is an important, there's also important lessons we can take by looking primarily at the relation between chemical stuff rather than to the chemical stuff themselves. Now, also interestingly, from a historical perspective, I'm not a historian of chemistry, but I noticed that a little bit trying to go through, you know, um, some classic te textbooks in the history of chemistry, like um, uh, the Fontana history of chemistry. Uh, there is no, uh, while there are scat while there is scattered information on chemical reactions, I haven't found um, any chapter, monograph, or article that primarily revolves around the idea and the concept of a chemical transformation, uh, which is very interesting and surprising in many ways. That's why I say here, it's a story that hasn't been told yet, right? But how chemical reactions came as the, this idea, uh, this notion, how it came about, uh, when did it emerge, it only comes as a secondary idea when we look at the history of you know, the idea of the elements and the idea of the atoms and how they relate to each other. But not as a primary um, kind of focus. Here, on my own, uh, I took some uh, episodes from the history of chemistry that I think uh, play an important role in understanding um, chemical reactions and how they have evolved historically. Of course, this is Ah, sorry, this is in Greek. Yes, okay. Um, disregard. Um, this is a very incomplete rendering of the history of this idea, but some episodes I think are, are important. So we have Albertus Magnus, 1250. He brings forward the idea of affinities, which is the tendency of chemical substances to combine with each other, right? So here we have one idea that brings forward this idea of chemical transformation. Then we have the first affinity table by Etienne François uh, Jeffrey in 1718. Uh, I will show it afterwards as well. Uh, these are tables which show you how different substances uh, tend to combine with other substances more than with others, right? Then in 1615, uh, Jean Be Begin, Begin, uh brought forward the first chemical equations. This is the one. Doesn't look like a chemical equation in modern sense, but still, this is supposed to be, at least according to Wikipedia, the first chemical equation uh, from 1615. Then we have, of course, Boyle with the skeptical chemist in 1661, where he said that the elements are stuff that cannot be further um, uh, split up through uh, chemical reactions. And Lavoisier, who crystallized the definition of chemical elements <coughs> even more. Another very important part of what uh, Lavoisier did, he brought forward the conservation of mass law in chemical reactions. Right? So we have a transformation that doesn't involve an, incre uh, an, an increase or decrease of the mass of the total system during that reaction. Very important um, episode for the history of chemical reactions. Then, of course, Dalton and the atomic theory. He brought forward the idea that the chemical transformation involves a recombination of atoms. Mendeleev and the periodic table. Here again, we bring in a more modern form, I suppose, some form of affinity table. Well, it includes, it includes much more than that. But here we have some periodic trends of how elements combine with which uh, groups of elements. And another last important part is also thermodynamics. We have chemical affinity. The free, energy, the free Gibbs energy, um, how important thermodynamics is to understanding chemical reactions, whether they're going to um, happen or not, depends on the thermodynamic conditions. We're going, I'm going to talk about this later on as well. Um, so yes, these are some of the most important episodes around the idea of chemical reactions. And I think there's something very interesting to be said from a historical perspective. I hope someone takes this up. I don't think I'm going to do that, but someone should do that. Now, um, apart from chemical reactions, now why think of them in terms of causation? Why uh, choose 
the literature on causation and you know the philosophical analysis of this sort to understand them. Well, there are different reasons. First, there are terms used when talking of chemical reactions that are suggestive of a causal relation. For example, take the reaction of methane with molecular oxygen produces carbon dioxide and water. You know, the term production is very popular in the literature around causation. Or cake butter rising is caused by a gas forming reaction between an acid and between an acid and baking soda. Right? We see that there are terms uh, used which might be suggestive of a causal relation. I don't I, I don't mean to, to say here that it definitely uh, corresponds to a causal relation, but given that there are some terms suggestive of that, you already get, you know, uh, a nice idea of why it would be interesting to look into that more closely. A second and more important reason why picking causation here is because causal rela uh, chemical reactions have been used um, as a paradigm as par uh, paradigms of mechanistic explanations. And I'm referring especially to uh, Goodwin, who talks of reaction mechanisms as a case of mechanistic explanation. Right? So they have been used, chemical reactions, uh, as explanatory schemes. So, and it is natural, therefore, given that we uh, think of them as a uh, in terms of providing explanations, to also think of them as causal explanations, right? Um, so this is very closely connected. Also, there is this intuitive idea that seems to fit that you know statement of reactions can be uh, formed as regularity statements. So when we say whenever A and B, then C, you know, this is a classic Humean way to form a, a causal statement, and this seems to be also a way that you could form a, a statements of chemical reactions, that whenever hydrogen and oxygen, then water, right? So this is worth investigating. And of course, though there's not a lot of literature, there is some in philosophy of chemistry, which has already started to look into this, and especially uh, from Hared, who wrote, I think I found two articles, not more than that, but I, I might be wrong. Uh, on uh, chemical reactions in terms of causal relations. And now much more recently, uh, by Su Suarez, Gomez, and Zambon independently, uh, who have written papers in 2023 in Foundations of Chemistry, I think, on chemical reactions being causal relations. So it seems that people are starting to uh, pay closer attention to this, right? But also, apart from everything that I just mentioned, we just need to start from somewhere to understand uh, chemical reactions. Even if they do not correspond to genuine causal relations, it's a good place to start. Because even a negative answer will be informative of the nature of chemical reactions. Now, what's the intuitive idea that uh, I've used as a backbone of the project as well? Well, we have reactions of this sort. Hydrogen and oxygen produce, say, water, right? Or more abstractly, you know, the reactants lead to products. Could this be understood as a relation where the cause produces the effect? This is essentially what I'm trying to understand in the project. Now, as it, oh, there's a different slide on the, ah, there it is. Now, as I already mentioned, um, thinking of chemical reactions from the perspective of causation is beneficial, and hopefully I'm gonna show this today, because it offers a deeper understanding of their nature irrespective of whether, at the end, we're going to defend a strong uh, causal view of them. And also, interestingly, it brings forward all the new issues around causation more generally, right? So there is an interchange here, right? We can get it, we can uh, take lessons on what chemical reactions are by looking into the metaphysics of causation, but also chemical reactions are a new case study that we can use in the metaphysics of science to inform how we understand causation in general. And I want to point out here that this is an important case study because it's a, a study from the special sciences as well. So it will be informative on, uh, on special science causation uh, as well, which is very important, I think. So hopefully, ah, more Greek, I notice here. Oh, don't pay attention, it just, it just says chemical reactions. I'm sorry. Yes, I, I thought they changed everything. Doesn't matter. Chemical reactions. Three questions uh, in the project. What are the relata of the putative relation I'm trying to understand? 
At what scale are chemical reactions found? Are these relations found? And what is that relation precisely? You know, what is this relation uh, in terms of a causal account, I suppose? Today, I'm going to address the first and the third one. The second one is the thing I'm trying to do with James, essentially. Um, so, what are the relata and what is the relation? Let's go to the first one, relata. Here you're going to see I'm going to talk about two issues um, revolving um, chemical reactions, which is catalysis and thermodynamic conditions. Let me just get into it directly and we will see what I mean. So what are the relata here? We have a chemical reaction. Take this one. Okay, we have the reactants, one and two. Don't make me name them. I don't remember the names. Uh, this is definitely what you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, reactants, products, the catalyst, and the thermodynamic conditions. This is the temperature, right? 630 Kelvin. Um, now, what are the relata here? Is it just the reactants and the products? So the reactants cause the production of the other substances? Or is it also the catalyst that is involved, the specific thermodynamic conditions, or even the phase of the reactants? A change in the phase of the reactants is going to be decided on whether certain chemical reactions are going to occur or not. Same with the solution in which we put those reactants, or their concentration. You know, they have to be the right amount for a reaction to, to go through. So there are different factors here. And this brings forward the first problem with identifying what the relata are of this putative causal relation, which we don't know yet what sort of causal relation it is. And I take here, I focus on thermodynamic conditions, but I think this also applies to the other things I mentioned before. So the first problem is this, a change in the, in the thermodynamic conditions can lead either to a reaction not occurring or to put it more, um, uh, in a different way, and even lead to different products, you know, even when the reactants are the same. So, should we count thermodynamic conditions as being part of the cause of a certain chemical reaction? Now, this takes us to a classic problem in the literature on causation. How do we distinguish genuine causes from background conditions? Uh, for example, the classic uh, example that, that, that people often use in this literature, I have a stone, I throw it towards the window, the window breaks. Oh, no, I don't like this example. The match lightning uh, with a fire. I have a, a match, I light the fire, but if there were no oxygen in the room, the match wouldn't light up, right? So is oxygen part of the cause, or is it just me lighting up the, the light? I don't know how to call it. So this is a classic problem. I'm going to answer it later. I just want to point out the problems here. Now, a second problem, which is more special with catalysis. Let me explain a little bit what catalysts are. Catalysts are substances that increase the rate of a reaction and minimize the energy required for it to take place. A catalyst, let me remind you here, this is a catalyst here. There is a reason it's not put as part of the reactants, and that is because it doesn't uh, change its chemical identity once the chemical reaction has ended, right? So it is not consumed during the reaction, and it can, in fact, be reused after the chemical reaction has occurred. Nevertheless, some catalysts do change during the course of a reaction and return to their initial form when it has ended, right? So this, is this, this brings me to the second problem, which is this. A catalyst substantively, substantively takes part in the process of a reaction, even though at the end of it, it does not chemically transform into a different entity. Now, why is this a problem? Because it causes a conundrum of how we should understand reactions as causal relations if catalysts, on the one hand, are neither necessary nor sufficient for a reaction to take place. In theory, a reaction could take place even without the catalyst. But nevertheless, the catalyst is a constitutive part of this causal process because materially it takes part in the chemical transformations, even though it returns to its initial state at the end. 
Second problem, this is the second problem with specifying the relata. So you see, already, with the simplest question, like uh, not just what is the causal relation, what are the relata of this putative causal relation, it seems that we have two problems that we need to address. Now, in my view, in order to address them, we have to go at the causal relation and see how to understand it. Because by understanding the causal relation in a metaphysically informed way, hopefully I will show you we can resolve the two problems that I presented and try and understand um, how exactly this causal relation, what, what uh, relata are connected via this causal relation. Now, I'm using here Hall's classic paper on the distinction between uh, production and dependence. There's this paper in 2004 where Hall says there are two forms of causal relations, the productive relation and the dependence one. And I also use a, a very nice introductory paper by uh, Stathis Psilos. I haven't found the date yet, hence the question mark. But it's a very nice small paper that summarizes Hall's uh, views as well. So I'm using this framework to see uh, which theory of causation can help us, on the one hand, better understand chemical reactions, but also resolve the two problems that I presented uh, before. So the framework is this. There are the so-called dependence theories of causation and the production theories of causation. And these, we have the classic human regularity view of causation and the counterfactual view of causation. And then the productive theories, we have the transference accounts, which include the mechanistic accounts of causation, and the power-based accounts of causation. Now here, you can, um, you can tell me a lot about whether I have sufficiently covered all the theories that exist around metaphysics of causation. I am sure uh, people might not be happy with this framework, but we have to start from somewhere, right? And I take that this is a sufficiently complete uh, picture of you know, the main uh, standard accounts of causation that we can use to, to start from somewhere, right? So let's go with, ah, before. Now, let me also tell you the claim that I'm going to try and defend. I, I want to try and convince you that the production theories of causation work better for the case of chemical reactions. And this is for two reasons. First, because they seem to overcome, at least in a better way, not completely, the problems that I, I presented above. And secondly, because they capture more faithfully the nature of chemical reactions. Okay. So this is my claim today. Let's go to the first category, dependence theories. Regularity accounts. This is the classic uh, place where everyone starts when they start learning about causation. This, the, the Humean framework. What is it to be a causal relation? A causal relation is just the following. A is the cause of B, if and only if. There is one, a spatio-temporal proximity between A and B. A precedes temporally B, and all events type A are followed by events of type B. That's it. There is nothing more to causation than those three things. Okay. Um, an alternative way one could uh, understand the regularity view is also in terms of Marquis Ionis' conditions, where we have different sets of uh, causes that could produce an effect. Each of them, um, each cause in the set is necessary for that set to be a cause, but the set as a whole um, is uh, sufficient but not necessary in causing it. That's the Ionis condition. I hope I said it clearly. But anyway, it doesn't matter. I just wanted to put it here so that uh, I, I don't restrain people, restrict people in just one form of the regularity. Okay. The second view, counterfactual, is just this very simple idea. Uh, I just put it here. I wanted to apply it directly to chemical reactions so you could see how the counterfactual account works. If an amount H of hydrogen met with an amount O of oxygen under thermodynamic conditions C and with the presence of a catalyst A, water would be produced. What does a counterfactual account basically say? Uh, a statement, a counterfactual statement, um, 
of this for of this form is rendered true by the empirical evidence, right? And I can formulate chemical reaction statements as counterfactual statements, right? And this is what it is to kind of um, think of it as a causal relation. Now, how do they, how both theories resolve the problems that I mentioned before? Uh, recall the first problem: distinguishing causes from background conditions. Now here, um, the problem with all of the accounts, the counterfactual account, uh, you know, if you go to Lewis's regularity account, or even later on other ideas uh, within, you know, the regularity, uh, within the dependence view of causation, is that they admit everything as the cause of a chemical reaction, right? So the counterfactual statements, are rendered true only if we admit all the factors that figure in the realization of the reaction. That's why I put it that way. Wait, where is it? If I hadn't mentioned under specific thermodynamic conditions and with the presence of catalyst A, the, the counterfactual statement would not be true. Right? It can only be true if you specify these conditions. So this suggests that you have to admit them as part of the causes. The same, now, how did Lewis try to overcome this problem? Well, he didn't really overcome it. He said that, well, the distinction between causes and background conditions is very <coughs> pragmatic. You have to bite the bullet uh, within the regularity framework. Um, you know, depending on the use you have of a putative causal relation, Lewis says, uh, you identify some stuff as the, as the causes and other stuff as the background conditions. But if the use or if the purpose you're using that, relate, that the statement changes, it might change what you identify as a cause or not, right? So that's what Lewis says. This implies, in the case here, that everything is part of a cause, including the catalyst, the conditions, the concentration of the reactants, the solution, and so forth, right? Another solution which I found within this framework is from the Hardin and Honoré paper in 1959, where they said, well, actually, you don't have to be pragmatic about how you distinguish between the two. Everything OK? No. No, no, no. Ah, OK. Um, I think you have solved it, Ah, OK. Uh, you don't have to be pragmatic. What you can do is say, well, those things that are the causes are only those that correspond to non-normal divergent conditions. Right? So the reason why oxygen, when I light up uh, a match, is not part of the cause is because the presence of oxygen is mostly normal. Right? Everywhere we find oxygen. It would be uh, non-divergent, or rather, it would be abnormal not to have not oxygen. And that's why it corresponds to a normal background condition, the presence of oxygen, and that's why it's not identified as a cause. Whereas the lightening of the match that's the divergent thing that happens at that point, and that's why that's the cause and not the oxygen. Now, that's the main idea, but I don't think we can apply it here, because in the case of chemical reactions, um, you know, okay, we have spontaneous reactions that happen in nature, naturally, but in chemistry, we have so many chemical reactions that happen in unnatural thermodynamic settings, right? So we would have to exclude those reactions uh, as putative causal relations. Or to put it differently, even within this framework, at least for non-spontaneous reactions, thermodynamic conditions would have to be counted as causes. Right? So for me, this doesn't work. Now, the second problem with catalysis. Well, here, I've been thinking a little bit about this. Um, I think that this problem is rendered a bit moot, given that the first problem already gives me the result that catalysts are part of the causes. The, first, the second problem, you know, it just adds, uh, just makes things a little bit worse, or that, uh, but the situation is already bad, you know? However, for what is worth, uh, at least under the counterfactual accounts, one could make the argument that catalysts uh, may not count as the causes under this account. Because counterfactual statements are rendered true even without machining catalysts. 
And why is that? Because in principle, a chemical reaction could occur even though very, very slowly, even without a catalyst, right? So strictly speaking, I was wrong when I said that it was rendered true if I mentioned the catalyst, only if I mentioned the catalyst. The counterfactual statement is rendered true even without mentioning it. So it seems that maybe here we don't have this problem. I don't have a better uh, response to this. I take the second problem to be so um, uh, substantial that it kind of supersedes the second one. But apart from that, I have an extra problem with the dependence theories that I think also works against choosing them when understanding chemical reactions as causal relations. And the problem is this. Here, uh, under the dependence theories, as you know, as you let me rather, let me go here. Notice here, implicitly at least, I talk of, about a very particular event. I may have not specified time and place, but I do talk about a specific amount of hydrogen coming together with a specific amount of oxygen under specific conditions and with the presence of specific catalysts. And also what I should have mentioned here, you know, with a specific solution under specific uh, phases and producing a very specific event, right? I am not talking about abstract events. And that's a problem because in chemistry, the most useful representations of chemical reactions are abstract representations of them, of the form acid and base leads salt to water, or here, hydrogen and oxygen leads to water. I don't really mention, you know, if you go to chemistry textbooks, I might not even have the phases mentioned sometimes of certain chemical reactions. So there are some abstract forms here that are highly important, very explanatory when it comes to teaching what chemical reactions are, but that don't really work well uh, in the framework of uh, dependence theories. Because in the dependence theories, as we saw with the counterfactual account, but also with the regularity theory, we have, a, rather, we specify relations, causal relations between specific events, not between abstract events. Now, there are different options that one could go for, given this extra problem. The one option is to admit these uh, abstractions as what they are, as idealizations or abstractions of token causal relations that are not fundamental or even not genuinely causal, right? Now, um, why could this be a problem? Well, because it would undermine the idea of chemical kinds. Now, I know Peter is against acids and bases being chemical kinds, right? But, at least when it comes to elements or substance compounds, there are many people, many philosophers, who do believe that these correspond to chemical kinds, you know, of a substantial metaphysical form. Now, if we are to take these as mere abstractions or idealizations, I don't know how this would fit with the idea that they correspond to chemical kinds, at least, you know, in a, in a metaphysically substantial way. So that's the first option that you could go for, but it might, you know, lead you to have to um, undermine the idea or rather to, to uh, abandon the idea of chemical kinds. The second option is to admit them as type causal relations that are more fundamental than their tokens. Here again, why do I like this? Because it brings us back to another classic problem in the, the metaphysics of causation, which has to do with the, with the relation between token and type causal relations. So we have, for example, uh, Vanessa takes the uh, the bottle and throws it down as an effect of gravity and then this is the token relation and the general relation is whichever person wherever takes a bottle and throws it or an object it falls down right that's the type one now here there's a lot of talk in the metaphysics of causation on which of the type of causal relation is more fundamental whether the token ones uh, are more fundamental on which the type ones um, supervene, or whether the type causal relations are more fundamental. For example, um, 
under the regularity view, the type causal relations are more fundamental than the tokens, but not under the counterfactual view. So as Lewis, for example, says, presumably type causal claims are quantified statements involving causation among particular events, right? So here, I don't know what to say. I just pinpoint the problem, essentially, and at least two options that I've come up with. I'm sure there are, there are, there are more options than these two. But in any case, this is a problem that we need to uh, address, right? Because in chemistry, at least, if we are to be um, faithful to chemical practice, we have to account to all types of chemical reaction statements. And we don't only have specific chemical reaction statements, we have different levels of abstraction, if you notice. You know, this is one level of abstraction, and this is an even higher level of abstraction, right? Now, obviously, I, I suspect that you don't have to go with an all or nothing view. You could try and admit these form of abstracted relations as genuinely causal, and maybe some more abstract representations, uh, view them as idealizations, maybe? I don't know. But this, there are many ways that one could go in any case. So this is where we finish off with the dependence theories. Let's go to the production theories and see how these uh, tackle the, the issues that I raised at the beginning. Now, production theories. The general idea is quite simple, of course, many accuse them of being very ambiguous. The idea is this, uh, A causes a B in the sense that it connects, produces, brings about the effect, you know? Uh, the biggest problem, one of the biggest problems though is to um, clarify what you mean by produce, bring about, connect. Uh, some metaphysicians just say, you know, production is a primitive. Just take it or leave it. However you understand it, don't make, don't make me to try and further explicate it, you know? Uh, but the important thing I want you to hold from this is that here we have, you know, um, a relation that has extra metaphysical import, where it's an anti-human uh, perspective of causation. You know, the human perspective says, you know, a causal relation is just when A happens close to B, A precedes B temporarily, and when stuff type A happens, then we see stuff type B happens, nothing more, you know? This is kind of the human uh, idea that, you know, I'm not going to posit that I see things beyond what I see. Here, it's more of a not robust, it's richer, the notion. There's some sort of connection, I would say even necessary connection. There's something in the nature of things that makes them to relate and cause stuff to happen in a certain way, right? This is the main idea between, uh, of production theories. Now, this idea has been spread out in many different ways. For example, in, in the context of the so-called transference accounts, we have someone, uh, someone's famous work on mechanisms where he says, you know, A causes B, if there is a causal process that connects them. So connection is spelled out in terms of causal process, which is a mechanism, right? Um, now, how is this mechanism spelled out? He says that there is a transfer, an exchange of a conserved quantity, right? Another way to put this at Dole 2000, a process is causal if it possesses a conserved quantity, right? This is one way to put it. Now, here already, there are some nice parts of what we know about chemical reactions that might fit well with transference accounts. Um, indeed, as I say here, um, you know, if we look at Lavoisier's conservation of mass flow, what we could say is the conserved quantity is the mass. Mass is transferred from one type of entity to another during the chemical transformation, but in total, it remains constant during the reaction. So this could be this could be the, the, the you know the gist, not the gist. This could be the, the, the thing that, that Salmon tries to 
rather the conserved quantity that Salomon specifies as being the thing that is transferred during the causal process. You know, uh, so this is the one thing that I like. Moreover, we have reaction mechanisms. You know, when you see when I, every time I see Salomon's mechanisms, it goes ding 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 reaction mechanisms. Right? This is a perfect example of how, um, or rather, reaction mechanisms could be used to explain how the causal process exactly works under Salmon's uh, framework, or under, in general, under the framework of transference accounts. Um, some definition here, what is a reaction mechanism? It's a detailed description of the process leading from the reactants to the product, product of a reaction, including a characterization as complete as possible of the composition, structure, energy, and other properties of reactions. This is not a new idea. Goodwin has already published papers on seeing reaction mechanisms as um, you know, explanatory mechanisms. I just wanted to give a picture here of how a reaction mechanism looks like. You have a, a two reactions. This is a classic reaction mechanism in biology, apparently. So you see here, we have very specific steps where the electron goes, how it breaks or does, you know, it ionizes here and then it breaks the bones and then it, they reform here. We see how they go. You can see exactly stepwise what's going on during the reaction. This could be used, you know, as uh, specifying the causal process in this context. So already we have a very good candidate, but I think the second uh, account of production theories could also work well. Uh, the power-based accounts, here uh, the uh, production, the idea of production uh, is spelled out a bit differently. It says, you know, there are powers, dispositions, and capacities things have uh, that cause other things to happen. Um, here, this is the, the main disadvantage, if I were to put on the power-based account, but here we get even more, a little bit more ambiguous, you know? Salmon's mechanisms and the transference accounts give you a little bit of a, a, a more precise, you know, uh, understanding of causation as production. Here, it's like we resist trying to specify it more clearly, and we want to be more primitive, you know, there are certain dispositions things have. Things have that cause them to react in a certain way. So the, the, the match has a disposition to light up whenever I uh, scroll it in a certain way, you know? In any case, here again, we have a nice um, kind of nugget of chemical knowledge that we could use to empirically support this, uh, this account, which is chemical affinity, you know? Chemical affinity uh, could be understood as you know, the power, disposition, potentiality of reactants to bring about the products. What is chemical affinity? It is the tendency of an atom or compound to combine by a chemical reaction with atoms or compounds of a different composition. Right? So we could say that, you know, under the, under the power-based account, um, causes, or rather, chemical reactants, cause uh, the production of products because they have a certain tendency to combine and transform with each other, right? And this is why here again, the, the old affinity table, this is a, these are different compounds, and below are the other compounds with which they have the tendency to combine. Don't ask me which one, what, what, what is English one, okay? <laughs> but this is one of the first Ah, actually, it's written here in French, but anyway. So, the idea of chemical affinity is very old, very intuitive, and it could match well if we were to pick uh, this form, you know, the power-based account of causation. Now, with respect to the problems, do they solve the problems that uh, I mentioned earlier? Well, the first problem I think is overcome naturally because thermodynamic conditions, concentration, solution do not play a constitutive or productive part in the causal relation. You know, uh, the thermodynamic conditions do not have a disposition 
to produce a certain set of products under a specific chemical reaction. Or in the mechanistic explanation, the thermodynamic conditions, they do not seem to play a constitutive role here. Even though I grant you they are necessary for this reaction to happen, they do not play a constitutive part in specifying the mechanism, right? And as I said before, in the power-based account, it's the same thing. You wouldn't say that, you know, a concentration of H2 and oxygen or a solution in which certain reactants are put has a tendency to contribute to the production of a certain effect, right? So here we overcome naturally the problem of relata. We keep as relata as causes the things that are only mentioned in the, in the left side of a chemical equation. Um, second problem, what about catalysis? Or rather, what about the catalysts? Well, here, um, even though I think I managed to solve the first problem, this becomes a little bit more problematic because catalysts, as I said at the beginning, do figure constitutively in the production of the product because they chemically transform during the reaction, even though they retain, or rather, they return to their initial form at the end of it, right? So, in fact, I think, I'm pretty confident, but I don't have it here, you could see catalysts mentioned in, in reaction mechanisms show how they transform during a, a reaction mechanism and then come back in its initial form. So under a transfer, transference account, they might count as part of the cause. And maybe the power-based account might work better because in that case, you wouldn't say a catalyst has the tendency to lead to the production of certain products. So this might be a, a disadvantage mostly for the transference accounts, because transference accounts would have to admit them as part of the causes, but the power-based accounts might fare better. Right? So this is one way. And it's different from what I mentioned here, now I realize. It's, a, it's an idea just, okay. Now let's go to the extra problem. The extra problem, I believe, is also resolved because, in general, production theories fit naturally with the idea of chemical kinds. They don't undermine the idea that, you know, acid, bases, hydrogen, oxygen, water correspond to chemical kinds. Especially if we think of chemical kinds in terms of essentialism, that there's something in the essential nature of things that makes them belong into a certain natural kind, this fits well with the idea, you know, that they have certain dispositions to react, transform in a certain way, right? So I think problem one and the extra problem are solved pretty well under the production theories. For the second problem, which might be a good thing though, because it might lead you to pick a very specific account within this framework, because not all accounts work. Though I wouldn't like to uh, abandon the transference accounts so quickly because they match with chemical intuition uh, quite well. Anyway, so this is how um, I've thought of this. Now I want to make also a general comment why I think production theories fit better than dependence theories of causation for the analysis of chemical reactions. This brings me back to an idea uh, that Psycho showed in that paper that I've used, that is a very nice paper. He says that, you know, there is the main difference between the two uh, frameworks is that each one serves a different intuition. He calls it the regularity intuition and the intrinsic relation intuition. He says the regularity intuition is, is the idea that, you know, whether a sequence of events is causal depends on whether events of type A are followed by events of type B. This is intuition that is served by the dependence theories, by the Humean account, the regularity, by Lewis, and so forth. Then we have the intrinsic relation intuition, which says that whether a sequence of events is caused wholly depends on the relations and intrinsic characteristics of the particular sequence of events. This is what this idea is satisfied by the power, by the productive accounts of causation. 
And why do I mention this? Because regardless, if, if I hadn't told you anything about the causal accounts that I presented today, and I just went straight to this intuition, I think most of us would pick the second one as being that intuition which we believe serves better chemical reactions, right? So if we are to think chemical reactions as causal relations, we think of them more, you know, as causal in terms of uh, the reactants, the nature of the reactants being such and such in their intrinsic nature that causes the production of certain other chemical substances. We wouldn't think of chemical reactions as being regularity statements at the first instance, as you know, whenever I see hydrogen and oxygen, then later I see H2O. What we would mostly say is there's something in the nature of hydrogen and oxygen that makes them produce H2O, right? It's the second intuition um, around chemical reactions that matches better with the intrinsic relation intuition. And I think, although of course this is not you know, definitive support of these accounts, it kind of reinforces um, this idea that I have that these accounts uh, match better with this case study. So, conclusion. I think a non-human account of causation overcomes better the problem of it, rather overcomes the problem of distinguishing vacuum condition from causes in a way that is consonant with chemical intuition. And also, it's better because it's better supported by empirical evidence. I've put here, um, how do you call these? Um, exclamation marks. Because I find it surprising that a more metaphysically, you know, um, I mean, not ambiguous, you know, a heavier metaphysical account uh, seems to be better supported by empirical evidence rather than the lean and modest uh, regularity accounts, which do not purport, you know, uh, outrageous metaphysical doctrines about the world that, that we cannot see, right? It's a bit surprising. So, that um, stuff that we find in chemistry about chemical reactions seem to fit very nicely with ideas uh, and metaphysical accounts that are a bit heavier uh, than one would think. Of course, many open questions. First, which particular account works best from the productive uh, theories? And also, how are we going to deal with this type, type token causation, uh, the different you know, levels of abstraction of uh, chemical reaction statements? I don't know, um, but hopefully this is, you know, one step forward and we will find, you know, how to proceed on these questions as well. Thank you very much. Five minute break and we'll be back.
Yes, I can turn to you if you want to stay there. Yes, I'd choice. like to stay there. It's your choice. Okay. Shall so we start with questions that came in online, maybe? Uh, for now, there's none, but okay. we had a problem because we stream on another uh, address on the Suffices website, but not at the same thing. Uh -huh. So I, I try to write to people okay. when I realize that to switch. So some switch. There's people online. But for now, I don't see any questions no in the questions. stream. So, okay. but if, if there's any, I will. Kevin, uh, before I saw this last year, curiosity <laughs> question. <laughs> curiosity, well, well, yeah, curiosity question, but uh, the Greek word for reactions, what's it? Racism? Yes. Do you know what racism means? Dracy, action. Oh, okay, so it's anti or okay. Yes. That makes sense. And um, another curiosity question, but maybe a bit more substantial, with more substantial implications. So you were using uh, um, historical uh, examples from back in the 30s, 40s, 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 but back, back in the day it was more alchemical than clinical stuff. That's so true. do you see a continuity between clinical reactions and alchemical reactions? Oh no, oh, that's, a, that's a very nice question. Uh, in uh, a very thin continuity, very, very thin continuity. Um, the affinity thing is one thing that is retained because it's retained in thermodynamics. Yeah. Uh, but apart from that, it's very thin because there we have transmutation, and we have you know the idea that they can transform elements into gold or all substances into all metals, and then maybe all substances even some alchemists thought. Uh, so, but that's why it's so interesting to look into the history of reactions. Because I suppose it was more high scale and then you know, more like an incentive to use chlorine and some yes. discounts, I suppose. Yes, definitely. That would be, I would be really interested in reading about that. Well, you should say that. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I have a couple of questions. I'll start first with a, uh, a rather specific question. Um, so I'm a bit surprised in. By the way, a very cool talk and it seems like a very important project. Um, but I'm surprised about uh, 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 you dismissing of the catalyst cat <laughs> uh, as, uh, as, as, as coming out as dispositional. I mean, if anything is dispositional, it's the, the tendency to catalyze it. I mean, if substance has this position to 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 function as a catalysator of a, of of any well the trigger would be the fact that these substances are present mm -hmm. and then it does the catalysating work so it's not a property that's um, like categorical mm -hmm. about that uh, that chemical mm -hmm. substance uh, but it is something that triggers the reaction. So, I would find it a very good thing if the catalysator came out... As a cause? As part of the... Well... So, that I kind of agree with this pragmatical... Uh, uh, mm, okay. ...accounts where, where you probably in chemistry want to look at, uh, at, thing, at substances, first of all, uh, or the, 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 the stuff that reacts. Um, but you could also see it broader, and then you would like to involve all these other matters. Um, so, so whether it's causal or not, um, um, I, I think I can I can do, deal with both depending on the context in which you ask the question. Uh, but but just um, to think that you could rule it out by this positional account of course seems to be very weird to me. I mean. If, if any, as I said before, I'm sorry for repeating myself, but that it seems a disposition of that substance mm. that it functions as a catalyzator. Okay. So if that's the basis for causation, then of course it would be included as a cause. Uh, mm. Okay, good. Um, you're right. Maybe uh, I definitely need to be more precise. I wouldn't deny that the catalyst has a disposition to catalyze a reaction. I, 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 what I just want to say is that the catalyst doesn't have the, the disposition to cause a reaction. 
has a disposition to trigger the reaction, as you say, but that's a different thing, because a trigger is not a necessary thing for the reaction to occur. Yeah, but in these, in these regards, like, the disposition is the way to explain organization, mm -hmm. right? So you cannot say it has a disposition to cause, no, because, because that would already include the no, causation. Look, here, the, um, under the, uh, um, when you are a dispositionalist, you admit, you know, all things have the disposition to do many different stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the catalyst has a disposition to make things work uh, quicker. Um, uh, but, you know, here my question is not whether ca the catalyst has any disposition at all. I admit mm -hmm. it has that disposition, but that's a different thing from what I'm trying to look at. I am looking at whether it has a disposition to produce the, the products. Which is a different thing. It's a different dispositional property I'm trying to pick out here. I see. See, so I admit, I agree with you. It has dispositions, and it has dispositions that are relevant to a chemical reaction occurring. Mm -hmm. But it's not the causal disposition that leads to the production of the effect. But how to distinguish a causal disposition from from a disposition that doesn't one. take? Because oh, yeah. it's the disposition is supposed to be the explanation of the causation. So. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Here I have to think it through uh, a little bit more, I suppose. Um, I'm, I, I'm pretty confident you can make a conceptual distinction between the two. But there are certain dispositions that seem to play a role in uh, causal stuff happening, but not being part of the causes themselves, of the causal dispositions themselves. Um, but yes, I need to clarify that in a way that uh, I convince you, I suppose. Thank you so much for your talk. It was you. super interesting. I'm, I don't know, I think it's something kind of metaphysics or specific philosophy of chemistry. And I do have three questions that are more like curiosity for Okay. Me. Yeah. It's kind of a, the first one when you were talking about typing to incarceration, mm. you also mentioned abstraction and idealization. Mm. Um, and the degree in which we can find the uh, reaction in, in textbooks mm -hmm. or more detailed mm -hmm. reaction, chemical reaction. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but uh, could be an idea concerning the fact, yeah, you do have in mind what is the different type of type and the talk is more like concerning the generalization, mm -hmm. the but could be useful to say something more concerning the abstraction and the idealization mm -hmm. of the different degree in which the chemical reaction could be written mm -hmm. in biological practice mm -hmm. in order to try to unravel this mm -hmm. type token. I don't know, you know, it's kind of because you said abstraction or idealization. And mm -hmm. what do you mean with abstraction? And yes. Idealization is kind of the same or one no, is like the, the other. It could be useful to specify that in the our specific case of chemical reactions. This is the perfect. Yes, you're right. Again, here I wasn't precise enough. Uh, I, I just threw some ideas, pretending that the, you know the, there's not a lot of literature behind this. So, for example, uh, I think it's a, a Norton who does a distinction between uh, abstraction and idealization. I don't know if he uses those terms, but. The main gist is that you know we have um, um, it's between approximation and approximation and, and idealization. Right, yeah. right. Approximation and idealization. Uh, the one is you have the target system and approximate the other ta target system, I think. And the idealization is you take stuff out uh, from uh, the target system, if I remember correctly. You, uh, I wrote a paper about that ages ago, so I used to know this stuff, but I can't remember uh, exactly the, the differences. But in any case, you're right, there are different ways you can understand idealization, abstraction, and approximation. Um, and another important aspect is, you know, idealization is something that is genuinely false. So, for example, the not having a friction is false, right, the target system. Uh, the abstraction is that you remove some properties of the system. You just pretend they're not there. Um, 
you could some argue yeah, that one idea collapses into the other. There is no genuine distinction between those forms, that between idealization, abstraction, and approximation. Others say that there is a genuine difference. You could apply all these ideas here as well to see how they go for the chemical reactions. I was thinking about the other way around, kind of can chemistry mm -hmm. tell us something more that could be useful to give a new light on this distinction of conflation or overlapping. Yeah, it's kind of the, the first part of mm -hmm. your project when you're discussing is kind of this a reverse relationship. I, I think yes, I, I don't think anyone is working on that uh, now in philosophy of chemistry and applying uh, to see what kind of models in chemistry or uh, abstractions are made. So that would be definitely um, a good research project. Uh, now, the other story is, yes. if I have time, is in your abstract, mm -hmm. you wrote about the temporal priority of code. Ah, the cause today, yeah, today. Yes, I told to Peter just before that I presented in a previous conference this idea ah. of causal loops, but it turned out I was wrong. Ah, okay. So I just took it out and I, I, I decided not to think of causal loops anymore because um, I thought there was a causal loop going on, but there is not. Okay. There is not. Yes, it would have been exciting. That's so why all, all the double arrows that you present in the model are not double arrows. That's what do you mean? They are. There's no causal loop. No. So oh, okay. the idea that the, the arrows in the reaction is that you know a, a, a chemical reaction at some point reaches equilibrium. So it reaches a state where the reactants transform into the products and the products turn back into the reactants. That's reactant. concentration, but of yes. course in it there's things going that way and there's things yes. going that way. Yes. So that's, that's a loop. That's what I thought <laughs> as well, but mm, I'm, not entire, I'm not convinced anymore. But in uh, there are kind of reversible and irreversible uh, reactions. Uh, so it's not all, all the old uh, time about concentrations, but uh, kind of one moment there is a kind of irreversible uh, reaction, and then you don't have the kind of two ways. I'm not sure that is uh, uh, that is accurate. I think all reactions in principle are um, uh, reversible if you wait long enough. Yes. But yes, the causal loops would have been fun, but I don't think it works. But, but, uh, uh, yes, but it would have been it would have involved time travel. Yeah. Mm. But the the equilibrium is when it's my hope. It's not it's not each each reaction. It's concentration that we see at the concentration level. We see oh okay, there's equilibrium now. Mm. But at the micro level, the process is still going both ways all the yes. time. Yes. Mm. But, but I, I, I don't think this that will count as a causal loop anymore, though. That depend, depends on what definition of causality you use. It's a counterfactual causal loop. That's, that's a loop in variables like in Woodward or in, in, uh, in uh, Perl. Mm. That, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a model system with a, with a causal loop. Not at the same time, but it's a causal loop, so you have to find ways to get rid of it to apply the counterfactuals account. But it's even worse for the production account yeah. because the production account explicitly <coughs> excludes b directional action. Right. Salman and all these guys, because you don't have a clear transfer of a quantity if it goes both ways. It's explicit in the work. They all discuss about causal process as time, blah, 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 because they don't know what to do with the notion of interaction. It doesn't work, interaction. They cannot even explain causally how the sun stays around, how the earth stays around, because there's an interaction of quantities all the time. Mm -hmm. So they need a clear direction to apply the production account, traditionally, the Salman mm -hmm. Da. Of course, if you do disposition of things, I don't know. But these guys, they would find very difficult to apply it to chemistry because it goes both ways. They need they, they explicitly exclude interaction in their account. Hmm. 
they want clear transfer from a process to another one. That, that, that doesn't go back then, no equilibrium at all. Uh, there could be go back, but it must go <laughs> somewhere else. <laughs> it must be somewhere else that did go back. The, the, because it's difficult to have a, con a transfer of conserved quantity if things always interact together. But they don't, so it's, it's a sequential thing. But it's, it's so the reactor transfer right. something causing the product, so and then the product is transferring in that, that. In that case, you have to have a clear notion of what is transferred yeah. each time and go back and thing and go back. Yeah, I suppose you have to represent it as a line instead of a, a circle. Yes. That every time it's a different for, uh, for, substance, yeah. materially at least, it might for, be of the for, same kind. Yeah, exactly. For example, in Dao, which is much better than Solomon, because in Solomon there's some there's the idea of causal process, so mm. transmission. And when the two causal process interact, transfer. I see. And it's a transfer from one to the other. They, they, he has no mean to say, oh yeah, they both transfer stuff. Yeah, what does it mean? Because they want to, to make causality a process, yeah. which their dependence account, you know, that would be different. It would be a difference maker because of the cause mm -hmm. and not necessarily a process. Yeah. So it's you need it's much more constraining the transfer account. In fact, you need mm -hmm. to show what is the process, what quantity is transferred. Mm -hmm. So, so it's a, it's maybe a better for a realist, I think, mm -hmm. because you see the, the process, you yeah, can exactly. it. That so for realism, I think it's better for them than the, the other one. But you know, you need to find the exact thing that is transferred to say, or you say energy or something like that. But a little bit vague. Right? Yeah. The connection to chemical laws become important because if you have laws of that conserve stuff. Maybe that's the thing sh that should define your causality. But that will be related to chemical laws. I don't know. Um, yeah. Is there chemical laws? You, you could answer. I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. I, I, um, I don't have anything to say about that. Need to think and the catalyst would be important. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if I can check, I, I, mm -hmm. I'm not very worried about the catalyst mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. Because Klaus was here uh, as, as a first speaker of the gave He gave actually a very nice talk on, on most of the history of, of catalysis, how, oh, okay. how chemists discovered the notion of catalysts. And, and I, think, I think at first it came over as more magical than it is. Because there's this thing that you add to a reaction, uh, it's not consumed, and yet it helps you to to yeah. to, to make the, re the reaction happen. And and even as a, as a chemist, I remember being confused myself because they, they show you like thermodynamically, you 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 would expect a reactant to, to become a product because a product is lower in energy, so it's thermodynamically favored. Yeah. But in order to break all these bonds and cause the formation of the product, that takes energy, so you need to get, get over this activation barrier. And this barrier may be very high, so it takes just too much energy to, 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 to make it happen. So kinetically, it's not going to happen. Thermodynamically, it should, but kinetically, it's going to be very, very slow. Mm -hmm. There comes in the catalyst, and magic happens, because the whole activation barrier is lowered to something that even at room temperature can mm -hmm. easily cross the little mountain now and, and, and get to the products. And so it, 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 that, to me, it struck me as some, some kind of magic thing, because how does the catalyst lower this activation barrier? But I think once you look at, at, at the real theories of catalysis these days, we see that they, as you said, they play a very active role. Mm -hmm. And so it's not that they lower the activation barrier of the initial reaction mechanism, they just, they just uh, um, they cause a new reaction mechanism, it's yeah, really a new path. reaction path mm -hmm. in which the catalyst is playing a, an explicitly active role. It's mm -hmm. going to react with reagents, forming bonds, breaking bonds, creating intermediaries, yeah. which by the end, and this is still a magical thing, yeah. you know, uh, doesn't consume the catalyst, but yeah. in that sense, I don't see the catalyst as any different from any other reactant. Yeah. Ah, uh, you would put it as a reactant. Yeah, it's as much a reactant as anything else, because, because it, is, it is reacting with the reactants to create intermediaries to, to in yeah. the end, create a product. What is, what, is, what, is, what is special about them is that 
during this whole reaction mechanism process, in the end, they, they come out in, in the same form. That's what we call a catalyst, but they have been as much reactants as any of the other reactants, I would say. Yes, but they, well, wouldn't you find them a bit strange? Because if you put them as a cause, you would have to put it as part of the effect as well. They have to come out as part of the products too. You would you would say they're the effect as well because they they appear as yeah. one of the products as well. Yeah. If you have to put them in one side of the relation, don't you have to put them in the, in the other side too? Yes, and I, I think you I think you're I think you would be perfectly right to say that because. But, but again, because we're looking at it temporally, yeah. So so at the beginning of the reaction, the catalyst was cause. As it as it as it as it worked together with the other reactants to 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 to, yeah. to, to bring about a chemical change, yeah. and you get intermediaries and they react with one another, and you know there's there's a lot of elementary steps. At the end of the of the whole thing, you got your products, and comes out again the catalyst, and so the catalyst is indeed is, is as much a product of the reaction. It, it was reproduced, reassembled, it's reproduced, yes. And so yeah, maybe maybe you could see it as the effect as well, but at a later stage, of course. Mm -hmm. Just to intervene, I think your notion of abstraction mm -hmm. here could be important because it's not the same reaction with the catalyst, objectively, because it's, or you have the both, and now there's a catalyst and there's a new there's a new path mm -hmm. of chemical reaction. However, at the higher level of abstraction, when you yeah. And then mm. they disappear. The same. Mm. This, at this level of abstraction, yeah. so maybe mm. your abstraction discussion could be relevant here mm. because it's not the same molecular reaction with the catalyst. Mm. But since the catalyst turns back to its initial state, at a certain level of abstraction, it's the same. Mm. So it depends where the production, mm. your production yeah. account is at what level. If it's at the molecular level, it's a different path. If it's at a more abstract level, maybe many things could be the same. <laughs> and there could be some criteria about that. Well, at the abstract level, you, would, you wouldn't even represent the catalyst. No. You wouldn't be there as part of anything. No. Mm. No, and, and if you would write a complete equation, it appears yeah. on both sides, so you could just erase it. <laughs> yes, that's true. Yeah. Um, Hmm. I don't know if that's problematic. However, you know, it depends. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's some energy the catalyst gets released. Yeah. There's something happening there. It is problematic because if you think you, you have to have the um, you know the, the more abstract level has to supervene on, on on the token level. If the token has as cause and effect the catalyst, it cannot be absent from the abstract level. No. Yes. Unless unless you get rid of one of the levels as being uh, genuine because of. But what do you mean? I think I think I see I see at least three levels that we we probably also need to distinguish to be clear. Is there's there's a type token level. Mm -hmm. uh, so this particular oxygen mm -hmm. uh, molecule, you know, reacted and formed a particular water molecule at the token level, mm -hmm. or we can talk about you know, mm -hmm. generally oxygen molecules like to turn into water molecules. Mm -hmm. Then there is a micro macro level mm -hmm. where you see this stuff oxygen gas transforming into water and liquid. But which we now understand in molecular terms as molecules reacting, and, and, and so there's there's this level, yeah. And what takes primacy? Because there's a discussion about that as well. And then I think there's what, what I, I don't know how to call it, like the specific generic level, because we learned that uh, that's a, those are very specific compounds reacting to form a very specific product. But as you say, you can generalize and say, well, I mean. Hydrochloric acid reacts in much the same way as sulfuric acid and nitric acid because, in the end, they're all acids and they tend to neutralize bases. So there's a specific and, and the generic the representation. Yes, somehow. Mm. 
And when we talk about catalysts, I'm not sure about what levels we're talking now. Is this like a type token or is this more the micro macro level? This, what, what would you say if it is more like micro macro? Macroscopically, it looks as if nothing nothing happens. You don't see this. Mm -hmm. I mean, this catalyst seems to remain present and unchanged throughout the reaction. But yeah. once you zoom into it microscopically, you see that it takes a very active role. Mm -hmm. And I would give primacy to the micro level and so still consider it a cause. But but it will depend on your causal model yeah. you want to use. Yeah. Because in in a difference maker model, if and you don't check for speed, mm -hmm. you don't see it yeah. as a difference maker. Yeah. Mm. But of course, it's doing something. <laughs> it's not the same reaction. Is that so? I mean, does do it's just a empirical question as a naive outsider? Um, does it is it so that if you don't involve the catalyst catalyst at all, uh, that that mm, the thing still happens, but then slow or very slow? Mm -hmm. yeah. Always, because quantumly you can always have yeah. well some. Even if, even if the energy level is ridiculously high, yeah. there's always a very, very small probability that you will pass through, yes. through it. But so maybe it's not the timing or well, for a very long time. So maybe it's, it's if, if, you, if you want to, to, to at least theoretically, maybe as for us for our practice, <laughs> you would say, yeah, no. no. So theoretically, uh, yes. I mean, I, I, think, I, think, I think thermodynamically, diamond, the diamond ring would love to change into graphite, but you're pretty Very safe that your ring is not going to turn overnight. So, which, which I'm more of a speculation here, but it should turn that end. It would be it would be better. It's lower, yeah, lower energy. energy. Yes. But, but but talking about it, I think because because in the end, if we if we if we ask chemists like what is driving those chemical reactions, what, what, what causes those reactions to happen. I, I mean, from, from you know, long back in the days as a chemist, I remember that this was the game we were playing. Yeah, we were looking at the thermodynamics of it, which is all about energies, yeah. Yeah. looking at what is energetically favored and, and, and what uh, it's, it's, you know, nature trying to reach the lowest possible energy state. Oh, so you, you it seems to be, it seems as if that is the one driving factor behind mm -hmm. everything that happens in chemistry for the much of nature as well. That is this, this kind of trying to get to the most possible energy, which is more ideological than, of course, if you put it like this. But. So it would be unfair to discount the energy as being part of the cops. That's what you mean. I, I wonder how it fits in, in into into any of those causal accounts. I, 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 I wouldn't know how to do it. but. Under the dependent, dependence use, it would play a very important role, much more important than under the production theory. Uh -huh. um, so maybe there yeah. it would get you know the the, the, the proper place, um, you know, energetic considerations as as would catalysis. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking maybe it could it, it doesn't have to be one way or the other. Maybe they can complement each other. The accounts of causation to give you the uh, you know. Uh, and a partial yet um, accurate picture of one aspect of reactions. You don't have to pick between the two. It can be um, a hybrid or a dualist account, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, that would be interesting, actually. Mm -hmm. Just, just an advice. Yeah. yeah. No, no, why? Just an advice. Mm -hmm. Nobody is using Lewis anymore because the problems are that he present himself in his paper are mm. not solvable. So most mm. dependence account today would word Menzi uh, um, uh, mm. and Perlow. They they are always much more restrictive in yeah. the kind of counterfactuals, mm. and it's always model dependent, which mm. would enrich your discussion mm. because. Mm. Maybe according to the model where the mm. chemists are interested, these variables, energy, yeah. is not fundamental in their discussion, mm -hmm. or maybe it is. Mm. So if it's model dependent, the kind of manipulation you can do, 
mm. closer to practice than this very abstract way of Lewis that yeah. I find very interesting, but each time yeah. I teach it, you know, it's obviously wrong for many reasons. It's, it's captured too much. Yeah. Causality in science. No, you're right. So I, the I, more I, restrictive accounts mm -hmm. maybe would be better for your product. No, definitely. The, the, there's a reason why I start from um, the old classic ones, which is mostly because uh, you know there hasn't been talk about this, uh, mm -hmm. the philosophy of chemistry. And most yeah. don't know about the literature, so you have to start from the beginning and see what this causation, how it was initially thought, what would, and then you know. Uh, but you're right. It's it's a more uh, contemporary account, that I'm sure it will be much more useful. It's more even if, it, if your goal is to exclude them and defend yeah. the production. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, you're right. You're right. No, it wasn't. Uh, you're right. I have other questions for them. Uh, so, so I was wondering uh, why you find it interesting or surprising that uh, more heavy accounts, metaphysically heavy accounts, uh, are closer to empirical empirical results. I find that completely natural. I mean, if you want to do psychology, it's much uh, uh, it's much easier to use uh, persons with powers and so yeah. on, and as as your main entities. Uh, while a union will, of course, deny their existence and try to reduce everything to some more basic yeah. stuff. Uh, but if you can like have an ontology with very like thick mm -hmm. stuff in it. Uh, and that will be closer to the practice of science, uh, yeah. right? Uh, yes, you're right. No, I, um, I think this was mostly, my, uh, um, you know, there is this idea in um, uh, naturalistic metaphysics that you you shouldn't posit more stuff than what uh, empirical evidence guides you or shows you uh, there exists. You know, you should be very careful with the stuff you you make up uh, in order to explain the world. And that, that's why I had the, uh, because in general the, 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 the human framework is much more modest, it doesn't posit more stuff than what we actually see, you know, it's much more closer to empirical evidence. And that's why I, I, I said that it's a bit surprising because, um, you know, although I suppose it's still, that, that is still true, this idea, it's just, it's nice to see how empirical evidence seems to match us with more heavy metaphysical accounts. Um, but yes, it was in this respect that I can see it. Thank you very much. You had questions here. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was, um, yeah, for, uh, follow up. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, maybe I think that which is this match between empirical evidence and this hard and metaphysical account? Mm -hmm. Is the account that you mentioned, this personal and the production theory, or between the uh, what so, are these empirical evidence that? So, in general, the, the, the dependence theory seems to be evidence. more modest in terms of uh, the empirical evidence, right? And the more the heavier metaphysical accounts, the second framework seems to be more, you know, to posit more stuff than uh, what we actually observe empirically. Um, but that's why I say that, you know, it's surprising the, that you can invoke more empirical evidence for the heavier account. The second one, rather than the first okay. one. Okay. And uh, if I have time, um, what um, you have to follow the curiosity because it's very cool. Um, concerning the, um, I didn't understand my my problem. It's kind of reaction mechanisms. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a framework that you use in in, in chemistry. Law, in chemistry, okay, basis. Is is um, is not a philosophical. No, no, no. It's a it's a chemical. It's a chemical yes, yes. And there is a parallelism between uh, these reaction mechanisms and, and mechanisms in philosophy. Account. Yes. It's kind of thing. Okay. They use the same word essentially, mechanisms in philosophy and in chemistry. In philosophy. Yeah. It means a different thing, yeah. but it's interesting to see whether there are certain similarities between the idea of mechanisms in philosophy and reaction mechanisms. And mechanisms in philosophy are referring to the new mechanistic mm -hmm. account of, yes. of explanation or yeah, exactly. more on okay. Exactly, exactly. But in this, okay, I understood uh, the, the link, but in this way, could be problematic uh, mm -hmm. to refer to more fundamental 
um, level, such yeah. as chemistry, yeah. concerning the way in which this account uh, is developed, because kind of mechanistic account or mechanistic account of explanation, for example, used in the philosophy of biology or philosophy of molecular biology in order to see how ah, this is the cell, this is all the parts that mm -hmm. interact together, and this we are talking about yeah, big molecule or organs mm -hmm. or spaces in the cell. Mm -hmm. But concerning the chemical reaction, we are talking about atoms, and we are talking about also electrons that are not discrete entities, they don't have mass, and it's more like mm -hmm. clouds. Yes. So how can we match without problem, or which are the problem in applying this idea that was born in another context, for mm -hmm. example, is used in philosophy of biology. In that, in that case, for example, when you show us all the, the reaction with the arrows and the points, but the reality is not like this. They're not classical, yes. It's not classical. Yes, not classical. Yeah, it's yeah. Not classical. And You're I was right. thinking, You're right. <laughs> how can uh, but I don't know if it's interesting or we don't care. Uh, yes, I, I was. This I was. Is my yeah. No, you're right. It, it it crops up. I was expecting uh, the quantum to emerge uh, at some point in this uh, in this talk. You have to somehow account for this. You're right, um, and I, it will lead you to you know the question of reduction and how the two levels re uh, relate. Um, I, I worked on that on my PhD. That's why I don't want to. Yeah. I'm like okay, enough. <laughs> I don't <know. laughs> but it is it is absolutely um, imperative that someone addresses that. At the moment, I just pretend that you know. Let's just take the classical level and see how this works. You know, um, keeping this uh, constant. And you know, there's so much talk about how this relates to the quantum and how the classical emerges from it. That I'm sure you know, you can uh, somehow find the right uh, view to match it with. But yes, it's essential. You're right. I don't know. But it's, it's, it's it's here, here too, the, the new mechanistic among the new is so flexible. Yeah. So it's so. Yeah. It's probably. I don't know because it it has. I had this. Someone I mentioned the other time as well. You have the. You know, the, the, the electrons are indistinguishable. You cannot say this one goes there and the other one goes there and it moves like yes. this. You know, you cannot specify the process, the causal process, so you don't, as precisely so as you might So you want. don't use MDC, but you can use another one. If, okay. if in your step you have something that is robust enough to be called monological, but mm. maybe MDC, yeah, maybe uh, it's difficult to see the, pro the entities engaged in the productive, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, yeah. I don't know. I mean, this is this is what we do. We get three of us from the middle. Sure, yes. the only electrons are indistinguishable, and they're actually clouds or whatever. But 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 no, but there is an this, underlying that there is an underlying problem here because if you are a reductionist, the causal relation vanishes down. It dissipates into the other mm -hmm. level, right? So yes. everything then it becomes futile to talk about it in the first place. Yes. But that, that was that was where I was trying to get at with the energy view. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, why why does the catalyst uh, uh, count as a cause? Well, is it because it is disposed to catalyze a reaction. That's a very high level explanation. You say no because it is disposed to react with that particular molecule and break that bond. Or you could go even deeper and say no because it is disposed to you know try to get at the lowest possible energy. And I think in the end we're yeah, we're going to end up with a very you know physics based fundamental. Mm. So maybe everything is going to be. Yes, but then you have the idea that there is no collision in physics, right? Yeah. So, which yes, yeah. I agree. You know, it's the same thing. Um, in, in, in my PhD, I had the same problem. But there, the, all the questions relate to each other. The answer to one affects how you're going to answer the rest. But I, you have to pretend at a certain point that they don't affect you. You have to focus on just one question and, and keep the other ones like whether they're invisible, I suppose. Um, but if you think of them hard enough, it's very problematic to build a very coherent account that takes takes into account everything. Yeah. Mm. But all is not disparate. You can 
in the new mechanist you can take glenan glenan it's not mm. mechanism mm. or causal it's mechanism defines causality wow. yes yeah so that's yes. so you show a mechanism mm. you show a causal thing it's bizarre he's alone to define that but yeah is, is that what you were trying to say so, because i wrote it down when you, you showed us the reaction mechanisms i think when you were discussing the transference account mm. and you said that um that yeah maybe maybe the whole notion of reaction mechanism could be used to so explain or the understand causal process, the yeah. causal process so that yeah. sounds a bit like what yeah Glenn and then does yeah you yeah know. what it is to be it's just that nothing else yeah <coughs> So what it is to be a cause? No, it's just to be a mechanism like that. Yeah. To be a mechanism. I'm not sure I understand Lina, but it's explicitly what is defending. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I actually see it the other way around, because for me, a mechanism is something really much more complex, because it is, it is, it is, it is a bunch of elementary reactions happening in sequence in order to yield an overall reaction. And so I would look at, at those elementary reactions, try to understand yes. what is causal about them, and then Yes, by That's nature. the problem with scale. Okay. Yeah. Next time, because okay, here you see, depending on the scale, you identify different stuff as being the causal mm -hmm. relation, right? Mm -hmm. In a smaller time scale, you have much more smaller, uh, smaller reactions going on. Yes. 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 Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Another problem. Yes. <laughs> One more problem to figure out. Yes. Also, or you use a richer tra transfer theory, and you go directly no mechanism but directly to the to the production but with a more a theory able to account what you need or you're permissive and you yes or you're permissive or you admit all of them yeah, then say that they're scale relative there, there's there's a nice transference theory that account for interaction in quantum mechanics written by me <laughs> in the paper <laughs> Uh, 2018. 2018. Yeah. <laughs> that is very not popular. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it also a big problem of chemistry. But yeah, I wanted to say for instance, sounds very natural. Yeah, because you mentioned that there is there's obviously conservation of mass during mm -hmm. chemical reactions. So there's there's that conserved quantity. There's so many more. Yeah. Yeah. As you said, the atoms are conserved as well. We're not going to see a dress mutation happening. Well, as the alchemists have wanted, no, we're, you know, we're, we're stuck with our building blocks and we're just mm -hmm. reshuffling them. Mm -hmm. And then there's there's conservation of charge, yeah? yeah. But, uh, we're not just going to create electricity out of them. So there's plenty of things that are beautifully conserved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right. But transferred around, yeah, we're, we're transferring mm -hmm. charges around all the time, mm -hmm. atoms are reshuffled. So, yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. more than just mass. So, yes, you're right. No, you're right. But not, not, mass is more problematic because you don't have conservation of mass. Some mass goes, some of the mass is transforming in the bounding energy. But conservation of charge, conservation of the kind of particles, yes. mm -hmm. conservation. You, you, have a, yeah. you mm -hmm. have a lot of conservation law to help you to frame the problem. Mm -hmm. How do they see the, the causal relation? Do they, do they see as as they see it as a process. It's really it's much more a process view of causation, isn't it? When? The, the, the transfer theory is yeah, it's, uh, it's in the production team. Yeah. Yeah. But one of the main difficulty is that from the, is that it's difficult if if I find a conservation of stamps or <laughs> so I have process the conservation of weird stuff. Should it be called causal? Mm -hmm. So now the the retreat, the retreat, the retreat. That now I think Max Kislev is saying energy, <laughs> so, okay. or accept everything. So mm -hmm. there's the two, or they accept just energy, and energy would be the real causal, mm -hmm. causal, or you have to be pluralist to accept all kind of um, conservation. conservation because it's difficult to know which one is uh, is uh, should be called causal. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Or is something else? Yeah. 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 You can all right. uh, so I was wondering. Oh, you, you you mentioned in the beginning that 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 there is an important problem to know what the relata are of this causal relation, but I did not. Uh, this problem didn't get, did not get any clearer for me throughout the talk because in usual causality you take as relata 
positions or events or something like that. Mm, yeah, that's um, a different question. While here you have two substances and another substance, and these are not related for a causal relation. Mm. And uh, I mean, at least not in any of the accounts that I know. Mm. Um, so, of course, you can then say the relation itself is not a causal relation, mm. but it's built on causal relations. But then, of course, these causal relations that are then events. So it's this kind of an abstraction or an idealization of things that are really causal relations between events. Um, and that, that would be fine for me, but, but like really just seeing the, the simple formula yeah. as, as being a causal relation, then it seems like you need a story why substances can be causes. You mm. see? Uh, because you wouldn't think of them as as events as you standardly do. Well, the they are not events, right? They are... Oh, the event stuff. of putting together stuff. The event of putting together stuff in close proximity. Yeah, but, but, but as a cause, it's not a putting together, right? It's the... Uh, or... Yeah, it's a complex event. I wouldn't know how to describe it. Uh, yeah. But in any case, it's not just... Mm. No, mm. Here, but this is another issue. I have it in a. Um, yes, I didn't mention it here. How you're going to? You're right. Whether you're going to think of them as events or not. But then, um, um, so for example, Harry doesn't think of it as events. They, he thinks of them as uh, chemical agencies, as agents. Mm -hmm. The reactants are agents that lead to the products, um, which could be one way. Um, no, I don't, I'm not sure. It gives a certain um, intentionality, which I'm, I'm not sure I really like here. Yeah. Um, you could frame it as being events. Harry does uh, mention them as, as, you know, formulating them as propositions of, of events. But yes, I don't know yet, to be yeah. honest. I don't know. Well, but if there are kinds of events, it shed a different light on the catalyst thing. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems to me that, that this question is quite standard, uh, like not, not standard, crucial yeah. uh, to see what, what are we actually talking about and yes, see yes. what do we want to accept mm. in there, mm. um, how idealized do we want to get uh, mm -hmm. from just plain uh, token events to these very abstract uh, mm. formulas. No, the, 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 it's a very complicated issue because you have, uh, you know, what are the relata? There are different sub-questions in order to fully answer it. Is it, it. The first one is, as you said, are they relata as uh, events, propositions, or facts, or something else? And then are they token or type? And then what are the relata? Are they the, the substances or the catalysts and so forth? There, there are many sub-questions to answer yeah. the whole thing. Not many, so it's a follow up concerning the type and token. Yeah. The another sort of question, kind of, was when we were discussing about the abstraction, say this molecule is a, is a token, mm -hmm. but actually in, in chemistry mm -hmm. they never have a molecule, they have kind of moles of stuff. Yeah. So from this mole, see, we have this mole of water, this mole of other stuff, and we see how it was all it is together, mm -hmm. and trying to write a um, formula. But it seems more like from token to token. It's kind of uh, it's already a mole of stuff, and we try to generalize to all the more possible. It's never kind of a, a token as we could, I don't know, in TT really imagine. So yeah. I was wondering if the question is could be or, or maybe it's not relevant, but it's, it's yeah. could be problematic also the category of token in, in chemistry. Concerning this fact that in practice mm -hmm. we never discuss about a specific molecule, and this is not uh, a, um, a quantum mechanic problem. It's uh, concerning the molecules. It's not uh, the, mm -hmm. the problem that we discussed before. It's really the the, the, the actual practice we never because we do have cells. Sorry, I, I work on, on the biology. We have cells. That cell, but mm -hmm. the moles are. You know, no, I would say this. In the laboratory oh. below, that that's that you know that bottle with that thing is the token that does that reaction. That's the token there. 
Ah, the token is it, million of molecules. Yes. That would be, and then even the, 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 the initial representation of the mode would be the first abstraction. Ah, yeah. Sure. It would be the first uh, type, say. The token is just in a very specific laboratory, a chunk of matter reacting and But also, changing the very of the of the yes, yes, yes. Okay. yes, am, yes. I, am I right that you track the reaction through concentration? So that's one way of tracking. That's one of the way. Yeah. But that could be the variables that are related to causally in practice. Mm -hmm. so and the change of concentration. It's not. It's not the the, the per specific molecule. It's mm -hmm. ah okay. It's going that way because concentration mm -hmm. not moving that way. Mm -hmm. Well, I suppose there are different ways to empirically see whether a reaction has happened. Right? There are yeah. different properties you can track. Yeah. Um, no. Not only concentration. Yeah. Um, yeah. But if you have a variables that is changing, yeah. mm. that's your only way to get the causal correlation <laughs> because you can check kind yeah. of dependence. Yeah. yeah. Let's see, five more minutes. Uh, still no question from, uh, and I ask. They said thank you for asking, but I have I have one, but it, it's a big one. Mm -hmm. But I, I'd be curious to hear at least mm -hmm. your your you know, intuitive thoughts or your initial thoughts on this, okay. because we've been we've been looking in detail at the nature of chemical reactions, but from a causal view, you didn't mention laws at all. So how how do you see the laws of chemistry fit into this picture? Are they Derivative? Are they somehow, you know, derived from the, the presence of those causal relations, or um, are the causal relations themselves somehow grounded in the fact that there are laws of chemistry? No, the causal relation, relations. If you were to establish that these are causal relations, you would say they would correspond to laws. You would take the causal relation to yes. be the law. Yes, the causal relation would be the law. Uh, I think. That's how I would frame it. You know that when I, it's a law that whenever I put hydrogen with oxygen, there is a, a water produced. It becomes a law. Um, what kind of law depends on what kind of causal relation you posit that is. Um, so under the productive theories, it would be a law of nature. Um, that's how I would frame it. I think that's how I would connect the two. Um, so first comes the the the, 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 the logo is derivative of the causal yeah. question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Well, in that case, uh, please join me in uh, thanking Vanessa once again for. Her.